Now, when you talk about Ukraine, my God, you mentioned 500,000 cream of Ukrainian youth being told they were defending their country, uh, being just kind of used as pawns of history. Um, what it's come to now is that despite uh, the protestations of, well, our president himself, July 13, last year, Putin has already lost this war, okay? A week before, the head of the CIA, Putin has suffered a strategic defeat. The inability and weakness of his armies have been laid bare for the world to see. July of last year. Months before, the head of national intelligence, Avril Haines, saying, the Russians are running out of ammunition. The Russians have no indigenous ability, the capability to build ammunition that they need in the weaponry. I'm very optimistic about the prospects for the spring offensive by the Ukrainian army this year, namely last year. Now, that's the kind of advice that Biden was getting. My God, you know, where were they pulling this stuff out of? <laughs> it's just crazy. So, so what uh, Colonel Larry Wilkerson and I decided to do about 10 days ago, we said, you know, we ought to lay it out for Americans to the degree we can and to understand how all this went down. And we found some stuff that is really revealing I'm not going to read so much, but I want to cite one one quote that we found from from a, a supporter of Obama. Now, Obama, you may remember, was against sending lethal weaponry to Ukraine. Now, why was that? Well, uh, Baker in the New York Times, their big White House correspondent, reported that uh, that Obama told his aides, look, it would be a really foolish thing to give the Ukrainians the idea that they could prevail against a much more powerful Russia on their border. So for God's sake, don't give them any lethal weaponry. Okay. Now, I remember it was about the same time when Angela Merkel from Germany, she was a chancellor, she appeared at the White House consultation. Then they had a press conference and uh, Western and German press were all there, you know. And uh, one of the correspondents says to Obama, Mr. President, now we're, I understand you're discussing giving lethal weapons to Ukraine. How is that coming along? Now, before I have a chance to answer, Angela Merkel shouts out, Eine schlechte Idee! <laughs> it's a terrible idea. <laughs> so Obama says, well, well, we're discussing it. We haven't decided yet. And then she says again, I need schlechte idee, okay? So she was against it. He was against it. And, um, and he warned a year later, look, uh, Ukraine is a core interest of Russia. Look at the map for God's sake, okay? Ukraine is not a core interest of the United States of America, okay? Look at the map again. And so we should really be perceptive in deciding what kind of interests we want to go to war for. That's Obama, okay? Now, back at this time in 2015, uh, one of his uh, minions, the Deputy Secretary of State, said this. Now, I want you to listen really carefully, just two, two, just two sentences. Think about who this was, the Deputy Secretary of State. If you're playing on the military terrain of Ukraine, you're playing to Russia's strength because Russia is right next door. Look at, he, looked, he looked at the map. It has a huge amount of military equipment and military force right there on the border. Anything we did as countries in terms of military support for Ukraine is likely to be matched and then doubled and then tripled and quadrupled by Russia, period, end quote. Remarks in Berlin 
2015. So who do you suppose said that, Stephen? I'll give you a hint. <laughs> He's now Secretary of State. That was Tony Blinken. My God, why did he change his mind? And where was Biden in all this? Wasn't he vice president at the time? Didn't he understand that there is such a thing as core interest, that there is such a thing as misguiding a country like Ukraine into thinking they could prevail in a war against Russia? So we uncovered this and we put it in this op-ed and we're getting, getting a little bit more resonance than we used to uh, for these things. Um, I want to ask add one more thing that we discovered. Uh, after Ukraine, of course, everyone said that, uh, oh, uh, Russia seized Ukraine, uh, Russia seized Crimea. It was unprovoked, of course. Now, for your listeners, or your watchers, uh, Crimea uh, hosts uh, Russia's only all year long ice free naval base, okay? It's been there since the days of Catherine the Great, for God's sake, that's when our revolution occurred, okay? So it's always been there. It's their, it's their key naval base. If the people who overthrew the duly established elected government of Yanukovych in February of 2014 thought that they could take over the rest of Ukraine, including Sevastopol, which is in, in Crimea, uh, they were sadly misguided. Long story short, um, Putin conducted a plebiscite there, knowing full well that most of the people would vote to to join rejoin Russia. So they did. So here's uh, here's what the Defense Intelligence Agency said at the time. Uh, there was a lot of a lot of talk about you know Putin and and was he paranoid and all this stuff. So so here's a, a little uh, two two sentences from. Uh, something called Russian military power issued by the director. Uh, he was a Marine uh, a Marine general. Uh, general S Stewart was his name. Uh, and there was, uh, so December 2017, the Defense Intelligence Agency concluded, quote, the Kremlin is convinced the U.S. is laying the groundwork for regime change in Russia, a conviction further reinforced by the events in Ukraine. Moscow views the United States as the critical driver behind the crisis in Ukraine and the Arab Spring too, and believes that the overthrow of former Ukrainian President Viktor Yanukovych is the latest move in a long established pattern of US orchestrated regime change efforts period, end quote. This is the Defense Intelligence Agency saying, look, all you people that think that that Putin is paranoid, well, we don't think so. We think this is the way he looks at it. Now, a little corollary here. When that intelligence community assessment was made, DIA was cut out of it. <laughs> they didn't want to have anybody from DIA there. And besides that, the State Department was cut out of that. I mentioned the three, the FBI, CIA, and NSA, okay? <laughs> you know? So what we have here is, is some people who got it right, who realized the stakes were pretty high for Russia. And, uh, you know, as, uh, as the current head of the CIA, Bill Burns reported from Moscow when he was ambassador there, and this is the last little factoid I'll add, the date was February 1, 2008. So we're going back a ways. The new, relatively new Russian foreign minister was Sergei Lavrov, had just been appointed. He's still the foreign minister. Uh, he hears these rumors going around that the next NATO summit is going to incorporate Ukraine and Georgia into NATO. They're going to make them members. And so he calls calls Burns in. Uh, get the ambassador in here. <laughs> Burns goes in. He says, Mr. Burns, <laughs> do you know what net means? <laughs> Burns says, oh, yeah, it means no. Well, this is a red line for us. They understand red line. Uh, membership in NATO for Ukraine and Georgia is a red line. 
Nyet means net. If this happens in Ukraine, there will probably be a civil war and we Russians will have to determine whether we need to intervene. We don't want that to happen. So tell your people, net means net. Now Burns, at that time, he played pretty straight. I mean, he even said in a comment, uh, hey, uh, Miss Secretary of Condoleezza Rice, you know, um, every country has is entitled to have their own strategic concerns. And, you know, we know from, this is not a only a neurologic reaction that the, the Russians are really afraid of the geographic strategic concerns here. So, you know, so, so this guy is playing it not only safe, uh, he, he's playing it straight, but he's playing, you know, he's even willing to get her upset because he, he she's working for Cheney, really. You know, so he knows what the theme is. So anyhow, what happens? Well, that was the 1st of February, 2008. Bush and Cheney are going out into the Western sunset that time next year. What do they want to do? Eh, we'll get Ukraine. Eh, we'll get Ukraine and Georgia lined up for membership in NATO. And then we'll we'll let somebody pick up the pieces. And so they persuade Angela Merkel and Francois Hollande, the uh, French president. Okay, look, we'll, we'll make a member. We'll say we'll invite them, but that's not going to happen. Forget about it. And they reluctantly acquiesce. And so the declaration at the Bucharest, at the Bucharest summit on April 3rd, 2008. So what? February, March, yeah, two, two months later, said Ukraine and Georgia will become members of NATO, period, end quote. Okay, so now this is this is Ambassador Bill Burns. I imagine he was pretty disappointed that nobody took his counsel, but now he's the head of CIA. And as soon as the special military operation was launched against Ukraine, despite all this stuff he was told by the Russians, all the stuff he incorporated in his memoirs, for God's sake, he immediately said, this was unprovoked. Unprovoked, came out of the blue. It's the Russians trying to take over Ukraine. And watch him, just watch him, as the president himself has said. It's not only Ukraine. After they deal with Ukraine, Poland, Baltics, before you know it, they'll be at the English Channel. I mean, these guys, you know, anyhow, I, I may be ranting a little bit, but it's just so transparently obvious when you know the, the realities here. And I guess there's good and bad here. Larry Wilkerson and I have, a, I think, a pretty darn good piece of the school of realism analysis based on hard fact here, okay? The bad news is your audience now knows this. I hope they believe it. We tried to get it placed in mainstream media. We tried real hard. I told you we started 10 days ago. Finally, last Friday, we said, it'll never get, it will never get in there. And so we, we published it in consortiumnews.com, which is one of the very best websites. And we're proud that they took it verbatim. Uh, and the re reaction we're getting there is, is pretty good. But just think, if most Americans knew this background, knew how Obama did something sensible, knew that he knew which end was up, and and cry out for explanation as to why Biden said, "Well, no, no, we can we can do this," and why Blinken said, "Oh, yeah, I changed my mind. We can do this. No problem." You know, it just begs it begs attention. And if I sound a little frustrated. I just ask your audience, shop that around, get a hold of it. It's on consortiumnews.com. If you agree with it, if you think, you check our facts. This DIA thing, why was it suppressed? Uh, all this other stuff has sort of been suppressed. Well, no, I won't say any more about this unless you have, well, yeah, the other thing is that simultaneously with these efforts, the main stronghold preventing Russian forces from going west beyond where they are now has fallen uh, even the ukrainians have admitted that it's called adievka uh, in ukrainian it's adievka but it's the place from which the ukrainian armed forces have been shelling the city of donetsk 
I don't mean any stronghold in Donetsk. I mean the citizens in Donetsk since 2014. So this is a major objective. And Putin, uh, I think, uh, can justifiably speak to his, uh, his citizens and say, look, your cousins, your people you know or you're related to in Donetsk, I no longer have to put up with shelling from this particular redoubt. And uh, the question, of course, now is how far west Putin's forces will go because they can go much farther. Yeah. Wow, wow, wow. Do you, do you think most people e even know that Zelensky and Ukraine were bombing Donetsk? And, and this was one of the main reasons that Putin invaded was you, Ukraine was bombing their own people, their own country. And yes, a lot of them were Russian. And, and that's why Putin was like, we've got to reabsorb this area. I, I don't think most Americans know that he was that he was bombing those people. That's right, Stephen. I'm glad you mentioned that because I didn't know how how it went up. The shelling went from, see if I can remember the figures. These are UN figures, right? Or they're figures from the um, uh, the office, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in, in your uh, in Europe, OSCE. It's a formal body set up by the Helsinki Accords. Now they have monitors on the ground along those lines. And it was from them we were getting this these reporting. And all I knew at the time was, yeah, 14,000 since 2014 already perished. Now, some of those, of course, were Ukrainians, but they say, rule of thumb, 12 of those 14,000 were innocent civilians in Donetsk, mostly in Donetsk city, okay? What I didn't know, because the OECD didn't publicize these figures, is that I think it was the 13th of February, 2022, there were 500 shellings. Two days later, there were, see if I can remember, something like six or 7,000 shellings, okay? And that's the way it went. It stayed at that peak until the 19th of February. And there are graphs showing this now available from the OEC, from the uh, Organization for Cooperation Security in Europe. Okay, they're there. I have them. I, I can show you them. So what does that mean? That means that there's that, and there's also the fact that the, uh, the Ukrainian forces, armed to the teeth now with NATO weapons, trained over the per previous six years with NATO instruction were all, not all, but almost all assembled on the, the border of Donetsk and Lugansk, these two, uh, two, two oblast provinces in, in that part in the, in the Donbass, and were ready to pounce. Now, that Putin knew that. I mean, you, you, get, you get good uh, surveillance, uh, and, and you know exactly what, what's going on. Were they about to pounce on, on, on the... Your Russian stock in the desk and you it seems to me they were, but I didn't know that. So I was a little surprised that Putin did what he did. I also didn't know how the Chinese would react. And this is the biggie, folks. This is the biggie. <laughs> Putin was up in Beijing on the 4th of February, same month now, 2022, and they were launching the Winter Olympics in uh, in Beijing, and he had a tete a tete with Xi Jinping. And long story short, he said, "Look, this is what's happening. The firing, the the shelling is increasing. They're not willing to deal with us on European security. Um, they even want to use move rockets into Ukraine. Or what do you call it? You know, medium range, intermediate range nuclear weapons." Uh, Biden told me that they wouldn't do that on the 30th of December, 2021. His negotiators never heard about that. And so in my last conversation with Biden was on February 12th, 2022. And I asked him, well, what, do you, what about that promise that you said you wouldn't put missiles, offensive strike missiles in Ukraine? 
He said, oh, you know, he wouldn't talk about it. And he wouldn't talk about not including Ukraine and NATO either. So that's the 12th. Okay. So we have the we have the fourth. And what did Xi Jinping say? To the great surprise of all my Chinese specialist friends, he said, well, you know, we don't like people violating borders. We're a Westphalia type of nation, but we'll carve out an exception for you. And they did. And everyone was surprised at that. So I was surprised at that. I was surprised because I didn't know what was going on in Donbass. So I didn't think that Putin really needed, really needed to do this. And I was surprised when he did it. Now we understand it a lot better because the truth has come out. And of course, you know, the icing on the cake is what were his objectives? His objectives, in my view, were scare the scare the hell out of the Ukrainians, okay? Invade and get them to make a deal. All they wanted was some peace and quiet in Donbass, okay? And they got it. From the start, first week of the uh, the ground operation, they got together in Belarus, and then they, being Russian negotiators and Ukrainian negotiators, and then they moved the talks to Turkey. And not many people know this still, but in Turkey they concluded an agreement where Ukraine would remain neutral, there would be a distribution of forces, and the, the war would stop, and uh, the Donetsk and Lugansk would remain part of Ukraine, uh, but with regional autonomy, as was supposed to happen after the Minsk Accords. Now, that fell through because the U.S. and Boris Johnson, as its agent, told Zelensky, no, 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 don't do this. Uh, uh, if you do this, we won't support you. Uh, if you. If you reject this, we will support you with this fancy weaponry and all kinds of other aid for as long as it takes. Bottom line, now the president says, for as long as we can, soto voce, we can't anymore because of that damn Congress won't give us any money. This is the way wars end, folks. This is the way we ended Vietnam. This is the way we ended that terrible war in, in Central America. Congress, our forefathers had the presence of mind to do, is the holds the purse strings, okay? If Congress cuts off money, then Ukrainians can't depend on us, encouraging them, as Obama warned against, uh, to think they can prevail against the much more, a much more powerful Russia. Oh, my gosh. Well, I'm hoping and praying that this does end the war. Um, it's it's a humanitarian crisis at this point, and uh, I just hope and pray that it will it will come to an end. Ray, I could talk to you all day. You're a you're a walking encyclopedia. I can't believe the things that you remember. Um, I appreciate you spending time with my community and helping us understand the truth. Is RayMcGovern.com still the best place for people to follow you online? Yes, and if they're on Twitter, uh, then at Ray McGovern will do it. 